Okay, well thanks for inviting me to talk this morning. Again, a whistle-top tour through what we do as a company and how it's um, <coughs> relevant to what we're talking about today. So basically I'm going to try and give you a quick introduction to what we are, what we do. Um, a very whistle-top um, lightning tour through uh, what RTM means, what it consists of as a process. Um, advantages, why you might use it. Disadvantages, why you might not, might not use it. Some examples of it being used with uh, manufacturing companies. And then some of the things we've been doing to try and control this process and to make it maybe more applicable to some areas that haven't used it before. So as a company, we're, uh, we're a small company. We're based in Salt Ash in Cornwall. Um, we're a, I say, a company of about 14 people. I'm one of the directors of the company. We manufacture a range of equipment. We manufacture machines for pumping resin into molds, polyester resins, vinyl esters, epoxies, phenolics. So equipment manufacture is about half of what we do. We uh, also build vacuum systems, um, put those together for people. A lot of the processes we're involved in are sort of driven by vacuum. Vacuum is often a primary clamping force in some of these processes. So vacuum systems have become a, a fairly large part of what we do. Um, we put together some of the ancillary bits and pieces that people use for these processes. A lot of our customers build their own tooling in-house, which is very much something which the composites industry has been used to doing. Um, and uh, so we provide things like insert sealing systems, clamping systems, uh, methods of getting resin into the mould, methods of getting resin out of the mould, all these bits and pieces. We build moulds um, in-house, so we have a, a mould building workshop for building resin transfer moulding uh, tooling for a whole range of applications, some of which I can show you. Uh, we design moulds. Uh, for other companies, so we get involved in either some in sort of just informal assistance or actual sort of formal CAD mould design. And we train people. Um, there's a lot of uh, um, situations where um, training is hugely important. A lot of these processes are fairly new to people. People are uncomfortable with how to use them, how they might be applicable. So training is a very important part of what we do. So as far as what the process consists of, um, this is a typical, this is an illustration of a typical, uh, in this case, a vacuum uh, resin transfer moulding process. We've got a mould, in this case a composite mould, um, that could be a metal mould. Um, we've got a vacuum system, which is providing the primary clamping force in this instance. Um, we're talking about a process, this variation of the process, where atmospheric pressure is the primary clamping force. We're um, at that scale not normally using, um, you know, mechanical clamping presses or or the such like, so we're holding the, the mould together with atmospheric pressure um, and we have a method of getting resin into that mould. There we have an injection machine, that could be a bucket and a length of hose, but uh, we're going to try and persuade you that that's not the way to go. Um, and so that's the sort of primary, uh, what, the, what, the, what the process consists of, the primary sort of uh, bits and pieces there. And as far as what it looks like as a process, um, the, the sort of primary forces involved. Here we've got two halves of a mould. There's the lower mould in section. This is a typical uh, mould. This is actually a CAD model of a deck hatch from a, from a, um, a boat. So it's um, a very typical sandwich panel uh, manufactured in polyester glass with a foam core. Here's the lower mould. Um, it might have some detail in there. In this case, it's got an ejector to help us demould the part um, at the end of the operation. We load into that mould the reinforcement. That may be glass, it may be carbon, it may be aramid fibre, it could be natural fibre. Um, in this case, is a, a foam core as well. The top mould has most of the, uh, um, the, the, sort of the, the important detail. We have a set of seals. Um, this is a vacuum-driven process. The seals are fundamentally, vitally important. Um, we've got a method of collecting the resin at the end of the injection a method of getting the resin into the mould during the injection and those two mould halves are brought together around the fibre pack. Vacuum is applied to the flange area so that's giving us the primary clamping force to compress the seals and to keep the mould shut. Um, we're going to provide uh, supply a vacuum to the cavity via a catch pot 
Uh, often that's uh, regulated to slightly below the level of this vacuum. And we're going to introduce resin via a valve in this instance, a, an injection valve which would be connected to a machine, a meter mixing machine. <clears throat> and then resin is introduced very often via a peripheral channel because the mould is held together with atmosphere, we've got a limited clamping force. We've got a significant clamping force. If you consider one atmosphere is giving you 10, 10 tonnes per square metre of clamping force, but still um, we need to be very careful that we're not going to open this mould by pumping resin into it. So peripheral injection is the most efficient way of getting the resin into there um, with, the, with the minimum amount of back pressure. And the resin will flow infusing through the fibre, permeating fibre, and if the mould's designed correctly, the final point of fill will be where that catch pot is. The vacuum is maintained when the part is cured and uh, out pops the part. So in theory, that's, that's what we're looking at as a process. That process has got a number of acronyms. Vacuum RTM, which I think is probably the more accurate one. Light RTM, which is, I think, a very inaccurate uh, name because the, you could machine this mould from solid invar or steel. It would still work in the same way. So the lightweight nature of the mould is a bit of, an, a, bit of a red herring, I feel. Um, and there are, as you know, a number of other acronyms that uh, have been used to describe it. But vacuum clamped RTM, I think, is the most, the most usual. And probably about 90% of the projects we're involved in use this version of the RTM process. So who uses it? Why, why would you use it and, and what is it used for? As, uh, John very eloquently said, this is a, a stressful world we inhabit. Um, there's a lot of different options as to processes you can use, materials you can use. And of course, if you choose a process, you're doing it for a, normally for either an economic reason or a technical reason, or more often than not, a combination of both. The uh, pictures I've just shown you of a mold show this type of product. This is a, um, a very typical marine product. It's something which needs a smooth, shiny surface on both surfaces as an open moulding process, um, it would have conventionally been two mouldings glued together. Now it's one moulding made from a closed mould. Here we see the bottom of the mould, the top of the mould. Here's the part. Here's the part in actual use. It's a, a table on the flybridge of a, uh, of a sea line. I think that's a sea line yacht. A very typical RTM application. And there's the mould with the fibre being laid up. Not very high tech. Um, but that's, uh, that's what it looks like in real life. Here's the lower mould. You can see the seals there. This is the glass fibre layup. Here's a machined foam core being laid in and the top layer of glass being put into position. The mould will be gel coated, obviously, to get surface finish. Um, as the last speaker mentioned, you've got all the issues of stopping some of this detail printing through onto the cosmetic surface. Um, but um, we've been involved in hundreds of applications that look very similar to that. So what are the advantages? Why would we choose RTM? Um, and obviously, as has been mentioned in a couple of the presentations so far, it's not a panacea for all ills, this process. It has to fit. It has to be chosen for a reason. Um, we're looking at this slightly differently, I suppose. The, the Out of Autoclave um, title implies you're sort of coming down the food chain somewhat in, uh, in technology. A lot of our customers are coming from both directions in the food chain. A lot of our customers are going up the food chain from open moulding processes. So we're looking at advantages compared to hand laminating often or spray laminating, not just advantages of getting rid of an autoclave process. Fundamentally, we're not limited by size. So if it doesn't fit in your autoclave, it doesn't matter. It's just a bigger mould. Um, running costs, availability. We can mould something with two moulded A surfaces. The example I just showed you is something where the cosmetic finish of the B surface is just as important as the A surface. So double-sided mouldings. And a lot of the marine um, products I'm going to show you are moulded exactly for that reason. We can make things that fit together. The composites industry has been notorious at, for producing mouldings that need grinding and fettling and cutting and rejigging, and each moulding isn't the same. That's been mentioned before. So consistency. Uh, making things that fit together. We're making some very complicated things these days from composites. Designers design things very accurately in CAD. They want things that mirror their CAD images. Um, it's a cleaner process. Again, looking from the open moulding processes, um, less emissions, controlling, controlling that's going to be a very big issue for the entire industry. 
some type of closed moulding process is an obvious start to controlling that problem. You can mould very complicated structures all in one hit. Cores, inserts, things which previously might have been an assembly. It should be lower wastage. It's fast and repeatable. It's faster and repeatable certainly than a lot of open moulding processes. It can also um, take on a degree of automation that a more manual process possibly can't and I can maybe show you some examples of that which is hidden down there behind that little uh, thing that says automation so what are the problems I wasn't going to put disadvantages I don't want to be too negative but there are some like we like to say challenges to all this what are the problems well mold design for a start people um, have really seen mold design for RTM processes as a black art a mystery that is only only available to a few uh, a few chosen people, which is complete rubbish. You can design a mould um, based on some fairly fundamental principles um, and there's a lot of people around the world successfully doing it. So it's, it shouldn't be a black art and I think demystifying um, the, the mechanics of these processes is an important thing for our industry over the next few years. <coughs> You're dealing with dry fibre, not in some ways not as convenient as dealing with a prepreg. Um, that has its own challenges. You mentioned the um, problems that Todd's been having specifically with that of how to get the fibre to stay in place um, while, you're, uh, while you're actually making the part. Um, the types of fibre chosen for the process are critical. You're now trying to pump resin or trying to infuse resin through a fibre pack. Very small apparent differences in the style of fibre can have a massive difference on that, to that, especially when you're looking at the higher, um, the higher fibre content end of the scale. Um, We've got significant compaction forces available, but they are limited. Um, so we've got to make things work within the parameters we have available to us. And if that's just atmospheric pressure, then you have to accept that and use materials that will behave appropriately at those given pressures. Um, probably a very big one, and it's a large part of our work, is the resin. If you're using a prepreg, you don't have to really worry about the resin. You just have to get it to the right temperature and it turns into a part. In this process, the operator or the, the process you have the, um, the control of the resin mixing is part of that process and for obvious reasons is a, a critical part of that process. Um, people don't tend to understand the process parameters very well, which is very often um, what leads to some of the nightmare scenarios you see, the, the real failures that have been in using these processes have often been for fairly fundamental reasons actually. Um, going back to the black art thing, often people haven't really thought through the mechanics of what they're trying to do. And very often process control has been either minimal or almost non-existent. So, uh, and again, that's an area where, where we're, uh, we're trying to make some differences. So who uses these processes? Um, the marine industry, I've mentioned several times before, here's a number of, uh, of pictures here. Very typical hatch covers, as I've mentioned, double-sided mouldings. Uh, this is a highly complicated part, a, a, a screen surround uh, manufactured for sea line. Um, it's uh, double-sided, highly structural, highly cosmetically critical, complicated layup, foam machine, CNC machined foam cores, a mixture of structural and non-structural laminates, all sorts of horrible inserts and things to take into care, to care of. Um, and another rather similar moulding, the top of a Sunseeker. Um, it's rather an old picture now, but at that rotating hatch is, a, is, a, is a molded, an RTM moulded part. We're looking at surface finish, big, white, smooth, shiny things, complicated structures, big structures, cost sensitive. They're doing it to a budget. There's a, an internal bulkhead. Um, from, a, from a boat, a resin transfer moulded part. That's a part that actually started as an infused part and then grew into an RTM part when the volumes were high enough. So that was a mould that was made to accommodate both processes, uh, bag infusion and RTM. Um, some internal parts of boat hulls which previously were hand laminated, absolutely perfect for this process, no cosmetic issues at all, purely structural, purely a nice piece of uh, composite geometry repeatability. The automotive industry, lots of the same concerns. Um, fast cycle times, critical surface finishes again, making something repeatable, 
very cost sensitive. Um, this customer um, um, up in the northeast of England making parts for Caterpillar and JCP, their only reason for going to a closed molding process was to get costs down. Um, they had to spend a lot of money to reduce their manufacturing costs. Um, and interesting things came out of that, such as the heating bill, for instance. Massive open molding process before, lots of hand lay molds, spray up and, lay up and hand lay up. Having to keep that whole manufacturing area warm, try not to kill their employees by styrene emissions, heating the area to get the temperature up and then extracting all that hot air and throwing it away out of the chimney. So going to a closed mold process, one of the big factors for them was saving cost in heating. And then at the more sort of structural end of the food chain, um, structural laminates, military applications, um, lots of successful examples of that, sadly most of which I can't show you. Um, that's one I can. This is uh, a part made by Pomali in Gloucester. Um, a lot of this vehicle is composite, but the roof of that vehicle is made in a very simple um, vacuum resin transfer moulding process. It's about 28 millimetres thick, I think. It weighs over 200 kilograms as a moulded part. Um, it has a lot of advantages as a composite part, but vacuum or an RTM, a closed mould process, um, answered a lot, a lot of their problems, which was making something which had a defined surface top and bottom, a controlled thickness, and a process they could uh, productionize um, much more accurately than an open moulding process. And here's another example of that. Again, a lovely moulding. It's a, a scanner bed from an X-ray machine. It's a row cell core wrapped in about 90% of the layer, or about 95% of the layer is unidirectional carbon um, wrapped and injected. Here's an untrimmed moulding. Um, that specifically was to get the process out of an autoclave. That's a company that was manufacturing using autoclaves. They couldn't, haven't got the room or the money to invest in more um, autoclaves to increase their production. They specifically wanted a process where they could make the same part um, without needing that part of their infrastructure. Again, going back to the choice of fibre, this was a project where we found the style of fibre in that project um, was absolutely make or break. We could make that part with particular fibre and not make it with other types of fibre. The actual specification of the two types of fibre was identical in theory. Um, what we found was some very subtle differences. So again, we do a lot of, um, of R&D in-house. One of the little moulds we're going to be running practically for you this afternoon is a, just a flat panel mould with a glass top. We make a lot of very boring flat panels at work with different layups just to, just to actually physically find out the permeability um, and, the, and the sort of performance of these types of materials inside a closed mould. And that's a, a nice little project, quite a recent one, um, a carbon epoxy uh, moulding, um, specifically made in RTM because really it's about the only way you could make that part as a composite part. It's replacing machined billet lumps of titanium actually, um, but that's now a fully RTM part, about nine different components in that. So looking at examples of people who've actually chosen to do this, um, this is an example, the first example. I've got three examples. I'll whistle through them pretty quickly. The first one is a local company to us, Princess Yachts in Plymouth. Um, they started off several years ago um, using RTM to make small deck hatches, small, main, mostly things smaller than about two square metres, of which there are lots in a boat production like that. They've now got a production with, um, it's actually considerably more than 300 RTM moulds. Um, which brings its own challenges. Here you can see an array of them. They've got several banks of production like this. You can see all the, the, the moulds stacked up here. These are moulds being laid up. Very productionized. Um, they looked at a number of things to try and uh, help them control that process. It's a very simple process, but they wanted to start <coughs> measuring things and controlling them. First thing was, how do they know which mould is which? Often the moulds would have someone would have scribbled in felt pen on the top of it. You know, Bill would have put down how much resin he injected in, then someone would cross it out, put something else. We developed a system, not specifically for them, but um, which they now use um, extensively of radio frequency tags. Each mould has a little tag, which is programmed from the machine. The operator just scans it. There's a little scanner on the machine here. The machine then knows which mould it is, how much resin to inject, what pressure to inject it, how much catalyst it needs. Um, 
all, all the parameters the operator normally would have set up on his own. Very simple, but it resolves a lot of mistakes. Um, the machine checks to see whether there is vacuum attached to the mould. One of their biggest failure modes was actually uh, the guy starting to inject having forgotten to connect the mould. If there's a bank of 40 moulds in front of you, he hasn't actually connected any of the hoses, or if he has, he hasn't turned the vacuum on. So the machine will simply check that the vacuum level is there and it is the appropriate vacuum level and only then will allow him to actually inject the mould. Very simple things to do. It's not rocket science, but it's, um, it's, it's uh, reduced their scrap significantly. And then those recipes that are in the mould, we can pre-program things like the amount of resin, how fast it's going to inject, what maximum pressure it will allow the machine to inject at, how much catalyst is going to be in it, and then it will measure the catalyst flow during the process to make sure the, the mixture is what you think it is and to preempt any, uh, any failure. The second example I was going to show you was uh, really um, the other end of the volume scale. This is a company in Northern Ireland, just outside Belfast, who wanted to make composite doors. Uh, no experience of composites whatsoever, which interestingly, I hate to say it, but was a major advantage for them. They had none of the bad habits none of the preconceptions, they viewed it as an engineering task simply with different materials that they weren't familiar with. Um, they wanted to make originally um, in the region of about 30,000 of these things a, a year. Um, composite tooling, not appropriate, it's very complicated, highly textured filigree mould, so they're machined aluminium moulds, hard anodized, photo etched to give them the, uh, the grain finish for the door, um, a heated press which we helped design a shuttle press, two A surfaces, one B surface, um, a fully automated machine. It's a one button operation. The operator drops in a piece of glass, very simple layup. It's just one sheet of continuous fil filament glass, no gel coat. The parts are, are painted afterwards, drops it in, presses a button. He can go off and do something else at that point. Um, and with a cycle time of about six minutes per skin. So we're looking at highly integrated equipment um, and we're automatically adjusting all the things that normally the operator would have, to, would have to adjust, including simple things like the catalyst level. As the temperatures vary, maybe throughout the production slightly, the machine has the intelligence to adjust the reactivity of the resin. Again, not difficult to do, but it can make a significant difference to the actual cycle time. And then lastly, um, I'm going to probably run over by about two or three minutes, but um, a lot of our customers, looking at the scale of, uh, of, what, of what they do, a lot of our customers use several processes in their manufacturing. A lot of them use open molding processes, RTM processes in the middle. Some of them use compression molding processes, but a lot of them use infusion processes. The, the boat building industry being the main one, they're making, they're making the big stuff using uh, bag infusion processes and some of the smaller stuff in RTM. And again, um, the challenge for us is um, to maybe use some of our technology that we've learnt about in handling and controlling resin, basically getting resin from A to B in a controlled way, and applying that to infusion processes. Um, sadly, the resin handling technology in a lot of infusion processes looks a little bit like that, um, which is um, probably familiar to some of you. Um, that's a ton of resin being mixed with a big stick, basically, um, with a lot of potential problems. So our expertise, I stress right now, we are not infusion uh, specialists. We don't specialise in telling people how to infuse parts. But as I say, we are specialists in getting resin in a controlled way, mixed and into a process. And this is work we've done. Well, this isn't. They would hate me to say that. But we've looked at a lot of this work locally again with Princess Yachts who've taken it um, to a pretty extreme degree. But we're basically replacing the resin hand, the, the mixing. We're putting onto a machine control some of the pre-infusion checks. So the machine is um, systemizing the checks that a person would normally do. Um, we're missing out the intermediate container and we're directly injecting the resin into the infusion. And then during the infusion, we're monitoring it and controlling it and measuring it and recording it. Uh, very simply, that's being done by pressure feedback. Obviously, if we're using a pump to pump resin into a, a bagged infusion, 
we're working at sub-atmospheric pressures, the machine has got to know when it's reached the point at which the bag will just start to inflate and you just end up with a big puddle of resin. So uh, we're, um, we've developed a sensor system which will allow the, the, the feedback, this is a resin runner, this is the resin coming from a machine, this is feeding back to the machine and telling it what's going on. Um, this is some of our early work at Princess. Here's a, um, this is my um, business partner Richard down inside a, a boat hull, but you see the black wires there are from these pressure sensors and at that point we were monitoring and characterising what was actually going on in this process. Actually what's going on was quite different to what people thought was going on pressure wise. It was rather fascinating because a lot of people's assumptions about what pressures you would read at various points actually weren't quite what was expected. But from that we developed a, um, a sort of algorithm to, to allow the machine to, to have the intelligence we were looking for in the simplest possible format and we developed a machine to do that that would basically allow us to check vacuum levels, uh, vacuum drop levels, uh, the temperature, viscosity and flow rate before we start so that we know we can get the resin into there in the required time. Catalyst flow obviously important or harden the flow with epoxy. And then during the process and material levels, are we going to run out of anything? And then during the process, pressure feedback, um, catalyst flow during the process, resin flow during the process, and uh, vacuum pumps, including what happens if you lose power throughout this process. Um, the big nightmare scenario is power cut. So uh, with the true spirit of paranoia that pervades our industry, we've developed vacuum systems with full generator, um, diesel generator driven automatic mains failure backups. So if they lose complete power to the building, the machine, the vacuum pump, um, and all the things they're needing to carry on working will carry on working. And remote control, important because these are very large structures and the machine operator is normally down here and the, what you're doing is happening about 30 or 40 feet up there. So uh, remote control has been quite important. During the process, we're looking at measuring everything, measuring whatever we can, recording whatever we can for, uh, for, for ongoing quality um, works. Once you start measuring things, people become really interested in that data um, and, and what they can do with it. And that's been an interesting process. We've written a very specific piece of uh, SCADA software um, um, to, to accommodate that. And that's one of the, uh, um, at the moment, one of the larger infusions at that point, but that's going to get a lot larger quite quickly. That's a 105 foot boat hull. That's about four tonnes of resin um, being infused um, from one well, from a machine which is sort of down here somewhere, you can't see it, but it's all coming, that resin is all coming through this manifold system here. And I think that's it. Thank you for listening. <laughs>